we now have a complete description of the hydrogen atom wave functions. Our starting point was the time-independent Schrodinger equation, expressed in three dimensions with a Laplacian of the wave function as part of the kinetic energy term. Applying our usual separation of variables to this function, meaning psi of r, theta, and phi, using spherical coordinates since our potential in the case of the hydrogen atom is a function only of radius, we're separating a radial equation from an angular equation. Our angular equation, the result of separation of variables, is this. And it's complicated, but the solutions we got after repeating the separation of variables separating theta and phi was these spherical harmonics, YLM of theta and phi. This angular equation is something that you get many times in treatments of partial differential equations, like the Schrodinger equation, in three dimensions in spherical coordinates. These are the sorts of things that you get when you solve for the wave equation on the surface of a sphere, for instance. These spherical harmonics are essentially vibrations of a spherical membrane. For the radial equation, what we got after the separation of variables for capital R, that function, was this. And this equation was slightly more complicated. We didn't just get simple sorts of YLMs that we could write down. YLMs being given in terms of a set of orthogonal polynomials and complex exponentials in phi. We end up with the same sort of solution for our radial equation though. The process is a little is slightly more complicated. Our capital R of R function we had to make some changes of variables, but what we got in the end was r sub nl as a function of r. As a, as a change of variables, we ended up with a 1 over r, simplifying things, to write things with this 1 over r factored out. And then factoring out asymptotic forms, and before we did a power series solution, we get r over a n raised to the l plus 1 power times e to the minus r over n a. Those were our asymptotic forms, and then we ended up with some polynomial of r over n a. And these polynomials ended up being associated Laguerre polynomials after we did a power series solution here. So we have a complete mathematical description. This a, incidentally, is the Bohr radius. It's a length, about half an angstrom, if you plug in the actual values of the constants. So we have a great deal of math here. Let's see what this math actually looks like. Messy. The final normalized hydrogen atom wave function is, has three quantum numbers, n, l, and m. The energy associated with this is given only by the n quantum number. The l and the m come from our spherical harmonic uh, portion. And we end up with some complicated normalization constants. Normalization constant out front, then we have our asymptotic forms for our radial function. The actual meat of the radial function is this associated Laguerre polynomial with <laughs> various orders. And the angular part is given just by our spherical harmonics. So it's hard to looking at this to visualize what this actually looks like. So let's consider some sample cases. First of all, n, l, and m is 1, 0, 0. This is the lowest energy, the ground state, and it looks rather boring. What visualizations like this actually show are surfaces enclosing regions where the particle is likely to be found. So really, this doesn't tell you with certainty what the wave function looks like, because the wave function is, of course, a complex-valued function of all three dimensions. It's not simply the expression for a surface. Our radial wave function, for instance, if we plot it here, r of r, is going to end up just looking like a decaying exponential. Um, <clears throat> if we're looking for where the particle is most likely to be found, we also need to consider the spherical harmonic component, but in the case of the spherical harmonics, L is 0 and M is 0, and the spherical harmonics are simply constant. So our wave function more or less looks like this function of radius only, which tells us that the particle is likely to be found near the origin. So if you have some threshold within which you're likely to or you consider the particle likely to be found, say, probabilities higher than this, you end up with radii less than some critical radius. And that's what this sphere is showing you. It's a sphere with some radius given by whatever threshold you happen to use. 
So if this was boring, let's find out what happens if we look at n200, or nlm is 200. Well, that one's kind of boring as well. It's not quite as boring, though. It's just difficult to see in this. If we sliced this in half, there would actually be a region where the particle is unlikely to be found inside this sphere. If we look at our radial function, again, our spherical harmonics being trivial, the radial function is the only one that matters. It decreases, drops below zero, and then comes back. So if we have some threshold above which we're interested in, find, or we consider the particle likely to be found, say here or here, we actually have two regions where the probability of finding the threshold is, or par finding the particle is above threshold, inside and outside. So if I slice this in half, if I draw a coordinate system, and just I'm just going to show the bottom half of the sphere now, I would have some internal region where the particle is likely to be found, and some external region within which the particle is likely to be found. Sort of two concentric spherical regions where the particle is likely to be found. These are not disks, of course, these are spheres, so I really ought to shade these in accordingly, but that would just make the figure even harder to read. These cases where L and M are both equal to zero have spherical symmetry, since the spherical harmonics, the part that gives you dependence on theta and phi, is trivial, it's constant. So for the case of spherical of, N, of L and M both equal to zero, you just end up with concentric spherical sorts of shells where the particle is likely to be found. The number of regions where the particle is unlikely to be found here, where the wave function crosses zero, is essentially given by n minus one. In this case, we have one place where the particle is unlikely to be found, this region in between the two concentric spherical shells. If we go up to cases where L and M are not equal to zero, you get something like this. This is L equals one and M equals zero. Now we have two distinct regions here, and I'll draw this in cross-section. I'll make figures like this repeatedly um, in, say, the X, Z plane. And there's a region where the particle is unlikely to be found on the X, Y plane, for instance which leaves us with two regions, one above the plane and one below the plane, where the particle is likely to be found. The fact that the colors are different here is telling you something about the relative phase of the wave function. The fact that these are sort of opposite colors, blue and yellow, are opposite in a uh, circular sort of RGB going from red to green to blue and back to red, blue and yellow are on opposite sides of the circle, so these have opposite phases of the wave function. When the wave function is plus one here, it will be minus one here. When the wave function is plus i here, it will be minus i down here in this region. Uh, all of these are, of course, evolving in time, so if I made movies of these, the colors would be fluctuating, but they would always be opposite colors on opposite sides of the xy plane here. If you look at the case where m now is plus or minus one, we get a slightly different shape. This may look a little unfamiliar if you're used to looking at pictures as drawn by chemists. Chemists don't like to deal with complex numbers, which is understandable. They're dealing with real things. Why would they need complex numbers? But in physics, we're dealing with wave functions which are expressed in terms of complex spherical harmonics. What that means, here, our YLMs have something that looks like e to the i plus or minus one times phi, m is one. So this is plus or minus i m phi, so i plus or minus one phi. So what we're looking at is phase of the wave function fluctuating as we move around in the phi direction. And the fact that the colors are different here indicates that the sign of the evolution of phi is different. For instance, here we go Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, around clockwise, whereas here we go red, orange, green, blue, violet, around counterclockwise. So the direction of our evolution of phi here is opposite. It's hard to draw pictures in that cross-sectional plane sense that I drew earlier, if we're talking x, z plane for both of these, but they don't actually look all that different. Where is the particle not likely to be found? Along the z-axis. 
And for that, I'll draw a dotted line along the z-axis. If what you're used to looking at are the orbitals from chemistry, you're probably used to seeing pictures 